Thank you. Um, I'll be talking about astronomy from space. And we've heard in the last two days about a lot of very recent results in astronomy. Astronomy is going through a renaissance that perhaps future historians of science will see as being as revolutionary as that of Galileo, Copernicus, and a century ago, the work of Edwin Hubble. So when you talk to astronomers, you hear them say the words, we now know a lot. And what they're saying is that we now know, for example, that 95% of the mass and energy in the universe is not on the periodic table of the elements. And they put it that way because they can, we can remember when I was in graduate school, we didn't know that. Just in the, in the course of, of a decade or two decades, um, we've discovered an incredible wealth of things about the universe. I'm going to take you through um, a, a few of those discoveries and uh, kind of emphasize the role of um, space telescopes, space astronomy in that, um, because that's the topic of my talk. But I don't want to, um, uh, I don't want you to think that ground-based observatories and theoretical studies haven't contributed. So the first topic <clears throat> is that we now know that in the first one trillionth of a trillionth of a second of the Big Bang, the universe went through a, a extremely fast, rapid, accelerated expansion, and quantum fluctuations in the quark soup were blown up to mac macroscopic proportions and became the galaxies and clusters of galaxies that we see today. Now, um, this was theoretically proposed in 1980, um, but the first observational evidence that, um, that supports this theory was seen recently by the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe uh, mission, WMAP, um, that's studying in exquisite detail the uh, cosmic microwave background that Robert Wilson discovered and told you about yesterday. We now know that the universe is, has a flat geometry. Uh, this is another result from um, the WMAP sat satellite. Now, we live in three dimensions. We live in a flat, three-dimensional uh, space. So this might not be surprising until you realize that all of the mass and energy in the universe introduces positive curvature. And that is exactly balanced by the negative curvature that comes from the expansion of the universe. <clears throat> so we now know that 95% of the universe is made up of dark matter, which interacts only through gravity, and dark energy, which introduces a positive pressure on the expansion of the universe and causes the universe to accelerate. This was first discovered in 1998 with ground-based telescopes, but was confirmed by the Hubble Space Telescope observing distant supernovae and by the WMAP satellite. This is the faintest picture of the universe that has ever been taken at optical wavelengths by the Hubble Space Telescope called the Ultra Deep Field. And in this field, which is 10 billion times fainter than anything you can see with the naked eye. Uh, we see that the earliest galaxies uh, were very small, intrinsically small, intrinsically faint. And um, galaxies have built up over time through a process of evolution. This is a nearby galaxy, but um, is kind of what we think the first galaxies might look like. So, in the modern universe today, we have spiral and elliptical galaxies. And so we ask the question, how, does, uh, how do these initial small irregular galaxies grow into um, the big bright and uh, galaxies on the Hubble sequence? Well, spiral galaxies form when, disk, when gas falls onto a rotating disk and creates stars in spiral density waves. Elliptical galaxies come from the interaction or the merger of spiral galaxies of roughly equal size. In this supercomputer simulation, um, which is, uh, fits in with what we see with the Hubble Space Telescope, you see two uh, major, two large, um, approximately equal mass spiral galaxies 
interacting, and as they hit each other, the stars don't collide, they just kind of slosh together and mix up all of the, um, the orbits of the stars, and we're left with something that looks much like an elliptical galaxy in the center. And as uh, Reinhard Gensel just said, the black holes that are at the center of every major um, galaxy uh, merge together and um, could turn on and form a quasar. Now, this um, is another thing we now know. Every galaxy, every large galaxy, harbors a massive, supermassive black hole in its center. Uh, we just heard a wonderful lecture about that. But I would just like to point out that um, this is a multi-wavelength study and includes um, data from the Hubble Space Telescope, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, XMM, and um, also radio telescopes on the ground. Moving to within our own galaxy, we now know that stars form with disks of uh, dust around them, which uh, merges together, agglomerates into uh, planetesimals that collide with each other and form planets. We also know that um, once the planets have swept up the dust, that's not the end of the dust disks. Occasionally, planets will crash into each other create a huge cloud of dust that um, forms another dust ring around the star. We believe that this is the origin of the Earth-Moon system when something about the size of Mars collided with the proto-Earth and split it in half. Um, we heard a talk uh, yesterday about extrasolar planets. We now know of more than 300 planets around other stars. And I'd just like to point out the um, recent Hubble Space Telescope result, which directly imaged a planet in the system, the Fomalhaut system. Um, Fomalhaut has a dust disk, and this planet is shepherding the disk into a ring. Within our own solar system, the outer solar system, um, the work of the Hubble Space Telescope and the Spitzer Space Telescope have um, imaged or detected dwarf planets beyond Pluto, including Eris and Dysnomia, which is Eris is actually larger than Pluto and triggered a discussion of the definition of a planet. But we've also discovered with Hubble um, that Pluto actually has three moons, not just Charon, but two additional moons. So very complex structures in the outer solar system. And um, some people would say that the definition of astronomy says that when we've sent a probe there, it's no longer astronomy. But I think um, one, of the, one of the astounding results of the last 20 years is the presence of water on Mars. Perhaps um, certainly within the last 10,000 years, we've had water flowing, um, perhaps even within the lifetime of the Mars Global Surveyor. We've seen changes on the surface that could indicate um, mudslides. So um, part of this renaissance has been caused by NASA's Great Observatories program, and three of those four observatories are still flying. Chandra X-ray Observatory, the Hubble Space Telescope, which observes in the ultraviolet visible light and just into the near infrared, and the Spitzer Space Telescope, coming to the end of its cryogenic mission in a few months, um, has observed the uh, mid to far infrared. But the next 10 years also holds tremendous promise, and um, I will talk about three observatories. The uh, Herschel Space Telescope, which is an ESA project, European project with a NASA partnership contribution, um, will be launched in April, I believe. I'm putting Hubble back up here as, as the future because We've, we're going to have one more servicing mission um, currently scheduled for May of this year, which will turn it into a new telescope. And then the project I work on, the James Webb Space Telescope, is scheduled to launch in 2013 as a successor to Hubble. So Herschel, which works in the far infrared, <clears throat> will observe the cold dust that is ironically in indicative of hot star formation in galaxies and peer into these dust clouds within our own galaxy to see the stars forming. 
Here's a picture of, of the Herschel Observatory in its um, acoustic test setup. There are three instruments on Herschel which cover the wavelength region from 60 to 670 microns. And um, the instruments, because they're observing the heat radiation, the infrared radiation, have to be kept very, very cold. This is a big tank of liquid helium. And here is the three and a half meter Herschel mirror. As I said, this is getting ready for launch. And I'm not going to talk about it, but Herschel's sister mission is the Planck mission. And um, I took this picture this morning of the one quarter scale model out the back of this building. I highly recommend that you go out there at the coffee break if you haven't seen it already. Um, they can tell you all about this microwave background experiment, um, which will follow on to the WMAP and um, earlier than that, the COBE results. So, as I said, we'll be going back, or astronauts will be going back to Hubble in May. Um, they will retrieve the um, Hubble Space Telescope and um, give it a complete new life. It will have new batteries, all new batteries. Um, the batteries on Hubble have been working steadily for 18 years in space. They get a complete discharge and recharge every 90 minutes. They're phenomenal batteries, but they are getting to the end of their life. And so we'll get all new batteries, all new gyroscopes, which Hubble used to maintain its exquisite pointing. Um, there will be repairs of two of the existing instruments where the electronics have failed. And um, perhaps most important scientifically, two brand new instruments will be installed. Um, the two new instruments are the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph, which is a high-resolution ultraviolet spectrograph designed in part to study the cosmic web, the gas that exists between the galaxies in the intergalactic medium. The Wide Field Camera 3, um, which is the third in a line of uh, radial, sorry, axial um, instruments on Hubble, will replace um, Wide Field Planetary Camera 2 um, and will be a multi-purpose camera, but uh, one of the things that it will do is find more high redshift supernovae, like this one. You see the, um, the galaxies with and without the supernova, um, which can be used to constrain the dark energy. Here are the, here's a picture of the astronauts underwater in the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory practicing installing Wide Field Camera 3 into a mock-up of Hubble. That's not the real one. We don't take it underwater, but um, it's a simulation. And here is the Cosmic Origin spectrograph pictured in the thermal vacuum chamber. Both of these instruments have been packaged up and shipped to Florida for the launch in May. Now, I showed you this image before, the, the ultra-deep field, the deepest picture of the universe. And what you see when you look at it, of course, are the nice, big, bright, foreground, boring galaxies. What's most interesting um, are the very faint, very red smudges that you see here. There's another one. They're red because of the cosmic expansion has redshifted their ultraviolet light into um, the red part of the optical. But when we look at these galaxies with Hubble and with Spitzer, and we fit models to, their, their, to determine the age, some of these galaxies appear to be several hundred million years old at a time when the universe is only one billion years after the Big Bang. This means that in the deepest picture that Hubble has ever made, we are not seeing the first generation of galaxies. And following on to that, um, NASA has determined that we need a larger telescope and we need a cold telescope to work further into the infrared than Hubble. It's much bigger than Spitzer as well, works at the same, some of the same wavelengths as Spitzer. So the science goals of the James Webb Space Telescope are, first of all, to find the first galaxies that formed in the early universe and study them up to the point where they reionize the intergalactic medium, to trace this process of galaxy assembly. Where did the Hubble sequence come from? What is the origin of the heavy elements in the universe? Looking within our own um, galaxy into star-forming regions, Working in the infrared, we can see through the clouds of dust and gas that um, block our view of forming stars. And 
using, um, among other techniques, the techniques of, of transiting planets, we'll be able to take spectra of these planets, determine the constituents of their atmospheres. Um, a, a technique that has uh, been proven very powerful um, using Hubble and Spitzer. This, by the way, is um, a real image. It's a transit of the moon across the face of the sun as seen by the stereo solar mission. If we were on Earth, the moon would be the same size as, um, as the sun and we would call it an eclipse. But stereo is not on Earth anymore. Okay, so the James Webb Space Telescope, um, as I said, will be launched in 2013. We have um, 18 segments that make up the primary mirror. Um, they are in various stages of polishing. This segment has not been coated, but it's polished fine enough that the bar beryllium is still highly reflective. And two of those segments have been through a thermal vacuum test um, taken down to uh, the cryogenic temperatures and, and having their optical properties measured in a vacuum chamber. This is um, one of the instruments, the mid-infrared instrument, um, which uh, this is actually a, an engineering demonstration unit that looks, um, works just like the flight instrument um, and has also been through thermal vacuum test. This is the um, uh, an engineering demonstration of the giant sun shield that will protect the, the Webb telescope from the sunlight and allow it to cool down to 225 degrees below zero Celsius. Um, this sun shield is the size of a tennis court and just for scale, that's a, a, that's a person in the middle sticking up um, through the hole in the sun shield. And this kind of brings up the question, we have a six and a half meter mirror, we have a a uh, sun shield the size of a tennis court, and um, this telescope will be launched as part of the European contribution to the mission on an Ariane 5, which is five meters in diameter. So how do you fit a six and a half meter telescope into a five meter diameter rocket? Well, the answer is you have to fold it up, and then following uh, launch, we will unfold the telescope. So right here, it's been launched from um, Kourou, French Guiana, and is leaving the Earth behind. We've already ejected the um, rocket shroud. First thing to deploy, of course, is the solar panels to provide power for the rest of the mission and the high-gain antenna, uh, which provides communications with Earth. Then we start to fold out all of the pieces. The telescope is launched with the sun shield kind of wrapped around it, so we get that out of the way. Separate the warm spacecraft from the cold telescope by means of this deployed tower. And then we fold out the, uh, the solar panels. After extending the booms, we separate the five layers. There's five layers, um, both for uh, thermal reasons. The bottom layer is obviously lit by, up by the sun and is hot. But also, if a micrometeorite pokes through, um, it's unlikely that we would have sunlight scattering through to the primary mirror. We then deploy the secondary and the two wings of the primary mirror. We then go through a process of tweaking up, aligning all of the 18 segments of the primary mirror to a common optical focus. Um, we uh, have actuators on the back of every segment that provides six degrees of freedom of movement. That's X, Y, Z, tip, tilt, and rotation. And then an additional actuator which adjusts the radius of curvature of the segment. In total, there's 136 degrees of freedom in the primary mirror. So there's, um, I've kind of given you a whirlwind tour of space astronomy in the last 10 to 20 years. And I believe that um, the prospect of these three missions and other missions that I haven't mentioned uh, mean that the future will live up to the promise of Carl Sagan that somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.